Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2020 panel discussion series, Uncensored, brought to you by Transparency Initiative Seychelles. My name is Marie-Céline Zialo. I am the moderator for today. And joining me uh, as our panelist on my far, far right, I have Mr. Ben Ajorj. Hello. Um, Miss Anna Rose Caris. Hello. On my left, we have uh, Miss uh, Da Silva. Hello. Mr. Knights. To start off, um, I will invite our panelists today to have an opening statement for about one or two minutes, your take on our topic for today, which is conflicts of interest. Mr. George, would you like to start? I thought you might pick on me. <laughs> it's, uh, the topic is vast, and uh, as, as everybody realizes, and it is particularly, I think, important in our context, given the, given the size of our, of our population. One is constantly conflicted in everything that one does uh, in, a, in a small community, and I, and I don't think we are uh, an, exception, an exception to that. In fact, we probably uh, are a, a, a model uh, to, be, uh, to, be, to be used. And I say this because uh, not only do we have conflicts on a daily basis and have to manage them, uh, but some of us uh, have conflicts at numerous levels. Uh, let me use myself as an example. Uh, as a lawyer, I constantly have to monitor my, my work to see whether I have a conflict of interest in terms of clients coming in. But I'm also a politician, so I have to constantly decide whether I'm conflicted politically vis-a-vis <laughs> uh, -vis legally. Uh, so it's a multifaceted, uh, it's a multifaceted um, uh, topic, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting and it's, uh, it's useful uh, that transparency uh, has taken this on uh, to, 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 to bring it to the fore and to discuss it. So thank you very much for the opportunity to partici participate. You're most welcome. Anybody else? Second, Ms. Yes. Mr. Silva. I think it's important. For me, I'm, I'm approaching it in a different way because of my role as the CEO of Anti-Corruption Commission. So um, uh, in my role, obviously, uh, it is important to understand why we have corruption. And I would say one of the main issues would be conflicts of interest. And uh, it is the basis of, uh, one of the bases of corruption. So uh, we expect high standards uh, in the public sector and uh, we expect a, a, a code of people to abide by a code of conduct, uh, which is uh, part of the Public Officers Ethics Act. So, uh, I'm approaching it from that angle, and yes, I do understand that we do have um, a lot of conflicts in our daily lives and conflicts of interest in particular because everybody knows everybody in Seychelles. Mm -hmm. So it's how do you then um, uh, ensure that you are aware that you are conflicted, and how do you then remove yourself from situations which will um, take away the perception that uh, you have been, uh, you have. Uh, uh, ignored the conflicts of interest mm -hmm. and uh, the perception that uh, something has happened because of who you know and uh, rather than what you know. Yeah, thank you very much. Ms. Anna Rose? Um, I would say conflict of interest is rather common, um, especially with the size um, of the country. And uh, what's, it, it's important that there are frameworks in place, there are measures that um, that tackles the risk associated with the conflicts and ensures that decision making is uh, done without and with minimized risk for the conflict of interest. And uh, with that, um, it's important as well that it's not only based on the person with the conflict to, to declare or to manage the conflict, but the frameworks in place and uh, even different measures so that, such as whistleblowers are able to um, sorry, are able to highlight the conflicts and uh, deal with it um, as necessary. All right, good, Mr. Knights. Yes, what's your uh, statement? within the small island development state context, and when you also compare it with the bigger countries like the the USA or the UK, uh, our situation is uh, fundamentally uh, different. Quite often. Uh, 
you would have direct contact and interactions with different people. And uh, the, the, the line is always, or the boundaries are always blurred between your private capacity or your professional, or <laughs> Mr. George's case, uh, <laughs> the political uh, uh, capacity that you're acting. And uh, I'll just give you an example. If you take Mr. George's, uh, for instance, uh, he's a politician, yes. He's elected as a politician, but when people elect him as a politician, they also see him as a, as a brother or a person that they would want to come and uh, communicate with. And it's not always about money. Uh, sometimes it may be to give advice, sometimes to give legal advice, or even to, to uh, provide historical knowledge or, or something on a personal level. Uh, to, uh, to, it's, it's just that type of relation, uh, and it's always blurred. Uh, but when we get forward into this discussion, I'll also highlight that the government of Seychelles has a number of uh, legal and institutional uh, frameworks in place to deal with issues of conflict of interest. Good, thank you. We shall come to these. Um, my next question for you all, I think before we bring it into the Seychelles context, which we are doing, which is good, I think let's um, try to analyze and try to define what do we consider to be conflicts of interest? What is this conflict of interest? What does it mean? Anybody would like to start? Well, yeah. it, if I may, I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a little bit like uh, a mythical animal. Uh, <laughs> you you can't really describe it, but you know it when you when you see it. And I think I think that is the the crux with uh, with with uh, conflicts of interest. It, it, I'm interested by two things that have been said here today. One is that you, it is a personal issue, but it has to operate within a framework. Uh, and secondly, the blurring of the, of the distinction. And I think those are the two key elements which, uh, which, which make the topic so, so interesting and so difficult to define. I think a conflict of interest has to start off on the basis of a personal approach. You know, you know at some point what is a conflict. And I think individually, persons must act on their core beliefs that this is a conflict or this is not a conflict. And I think that's a relatively easy um, decision to make, which unfortunately, as with many easy decisions, people refuse to make. Uh, and allow themselves to be uh, to to be to be blindsided uh, or blindside themselves, uh, and and not to rely necessarily on the institutional framework, which is very very important and it is absolutely necessary because people will not act according to how they should and they will they will know that they are conflicted but they will still try to push the boundaries. So I think it's a combination of the two in order to clarify this, this, this blurring that, uh, that is always evident. Mm -hmm. Good, 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 thank you. And Do I, we have another definition, maybe? Well, well I think it's, uh, it's sort of uh, in the word itself, sort of clon you know, the words, conflict of interest. Yeah. So you have an interest in this matter, and therefore you're conflicted. So say, for example, um, uh, I'm, making a I'm part of a decision-making process where a family member, my family member, is involved in it, and surely, I, it would be seen that I would be conflicted rather than being objective because there would be some element of bias and then possibly then an unfair advantage in any decisions that I might be um, taking because I am in a position where I am a, a decision maker and therefore it's not a level playing field. If somebody, uh, you're making a decision uh, about uh, something or somebody that is close to you and you become conflicted. So the issue here is to remove yourself um, in that decision-making process to ensure that there is a level playing field in any decisions uh, that mm -hmm. you make. But it is important to note that um, in the context of Seychelles, you linked to, um, uh, to a lot of people. It's not six degrees of separation. It's actually less yeah. because everybody knows everybody. You know, I can say, you know, like I know Mr. George and through my work and then, you know, uh, you might know my sister and my sister knows uh, <laughs> this person. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes this issue that uh, somebody could say, oh, that person got the contract because she knows the sister of that person. So 
it's where you're able to declare where the, 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 the interest is. So if I have a conflict of interest and I'm able to openly say, you know, I can be objective because that person is very far removed from me. And if we have a set criteria in the decision making process where we are being objective and I'm saying a close family member, associate or colleague, then I will remove myself. Then everybody's happy that I'm not part of that decision make, making process, which has given an unfair advantage about uh, you know mm -hmm. on a person mm -hmm. yeah we'll, we'll come back um, on that but i just want to have uh, at least mr knights what what would be your definition or your explanation of it well i don't have a particular <laughs> definition on it uh, sometimes uh, there are generally rules that mm. would set out uh, what is a conflict of interest uh, within the public service, you have the public service orders as well. Uh, that gives you a vague idea about what is a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Within the legal profession as well, uh, you learn about ethics and uh, there are certain uh, concrete things that you would know, but there are also things that uh, you wouldn't know <laughs> when a conflict <laughs> of interest uh, arises or you don't have uh, sufficient information yeah. about a particular uh, thing that is happening. So it is uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would say sometimes just go with the gut feeling and if uh, you think it is wrong, then you step back. Yeah, so go with the code of ethics or the yes. gut feeling, yes. yes. Ms. Karis, what's your take on the definition? Um, I would say it's uh, when you have, for instance, in the public sector and if you're an official and then you have a certain relationship with, that you're considering, for instance, in, let's say, in a procurement, um, and you have a certain relationship with the person or either a business relationship. So it can be different types of relationship. And from that point, it can be, there might not be anything wrong with your relationship or you might not be doing anything wrong, but it is apparent that there is, there is this conflict. And with that, it's important to remove yourself from the decision making process. Um, it would ad avoid uh, any any um, issues that may arise afterwards. It would avoid any um, confusion with re regards to the decision itself or any annulment mm -hmm. with regards mm -hmm. to the decision. Mm -hmm. And um, with regards to the gut feeling aspect, I would say it's safe to say it when the person is educated enough on the topic as it might not be as evident for anyone as it might be to us, for instance. Mm -hmm. So All right. okay. with you. that. Thank you, thank you. And we will come back on some of the things as well that, that you have said. Um, I, I've got another question. Let's, let's be a bit controversial now, huh? shall we? <laughs> All right, I've got a question about um, in Seychelles. Let's bring it to the Seychelles context. Do you think... What do you think, um, you know, we, we, do we address the, the, the topic of conflicts of interest enough in this country? And do you think it is, uh, we have significant cases that we need to make a big noise about this? Uh, what do you think? Ms. Da Silva, I'm coming to you because of your work with the, with the corruption. Yeah, it's interesting you, you raise this with regards to the Seychelles context to ask the question, has there been any cases where um, uh, conflicts of interest, because somebody's breached a code of ethics or, you know, a code of conduct in the public service, or, in fact, uh, uh, anti-corruption act. You know, this hasn't happened as yet, not to my knowledge, where it would have been the uh, the key uh, offence. Uh, I would say it's possibly part of uh, other offences. So therefore, it means that there is not enough that is done with regards to conflicts of interest. So somebody can have a code of conduct, you can have your procedures, your guidelines, you have your law, and then what? So uh, for me, this is where I'm interested. And, I, um, and it's, it's, it's really bizarre because this morning I had a meeting and we were talking about uh, conflicts of interest and it is just coincidental. And we were looking at um, contracts uh, for smaller contracts in districts, you know, which is not handled by the procurement office, you know, because uh, it's for contracts under 150,000 rupees. So um, 
people are alleging those small contracts is because you're giving it to your family members and all the rest of it. And so when you dig deeper, it's to look at, well, what is the process when awarding the contract? Did somebody declare that they are related to the bidder? Did they declare, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, whether or not there is a connection? Or somebody within the procurement unit within that ministry is, um, has helped uh, write that bid. So there are all those issues and we are looking at it because I think we might have all the laws and the guidelines mm -hmm. and the procedures, but then we come mm -hmm. to practice yeah. and this is where we find the issue mm -hmm. and there has to be more awareness okay. on this okay. issue. Then this is why I, I'm staying on this question because I want us to, to say it because I don't think we're saying it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what do we see, uh, I will come to you Ms. Clarice, what do we see in our, in our experience I know you work with the uh, UN youth a lot with, with uh, the country, what's happening. I think that we should be frank and, and, and being able to say, um, what is the culture here? What is the practice? Um, uh, I would say with regards to the culture, it becomes a hype when there's an issue and there's an issue on media. Um, at that point, everyone talks about conflict of interest. But before that, um, with regards to the ethics, the code of conduct, the laws, there's not much. There's not much education on it. And reason why I'm saying education, because it's more than just the title itself. It's a lot more. It's a lot more in depth. And there are a lot of different circumstances whereby someone can face the issue. And uh, it should even go um, at the lower age, um, students in secondary, because they they would see and they would observe a lot more if they knew about it. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, I would say there, there are institutions that are doing a lot about it. But then again, uh, it's uh, also about the culture of the institutions, the culture of how they implement their values. And uh, from that, there's a bit of, a challenge with regards to behavior. Um, if uh, the culture is deep, um, is embedded within the person, they will go about in different institutions and do the same thing. But if it's not, it's, uh, it's uh, a bit dangerous when it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit uh, dangerous when it's uh, reliant on the people's be right, behavior, okay. I would say. Okay, I, I'm still looking for somebody to tell me. Mr. George, maybe um, be bold and say, you know, do we have, what are some examples that we have without n naming people's names, but do we have, I know personally that I have encountered, so do we have... Uh, of, um, course, of course we do, we We would not be a normal society if we didn't, <laughs> and, I think, uh, and I think we need to realize that. Uh, you see, the thing with, the thing with ethics is it, it, it's the same as everything else. People live dangerously. It's, 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 it's embedded into the human psyche uh, to live at the border of, of dangerousness. Uh, one example that is often quoted to me is speed limits. If the speed, if the speed limit tells you what the maximum speed you should be driving at is, but it is a call to everybody to drive at that speed. And that's the, that's, that's the lovely. You never see somebody, or you very rarely see somebody, driving at 40 kilometers an hour in an 80 yeah. kilometer per hour zone. They will drive at 79, and I think, or 80 or 81. Yeah. And I think this is exactly the same for, for um, our ethical standards and our, and our issue with the conflicts of interest. No matter how many laws you have, and I think we have a wide panoply of laws, uh, uh, we, can't, we can't fault that. Um, we have an educated uh, population that knows the difference between right and wrong and knows when something needs to be done or not. But we also have a population that is a risk, uh, the population of risk takers. And we, we're constantly pushing the, the envelope out. Uh, and uh, as a result, very often, in fact, on, a, on an almost daily basis, uh, we breach these rules. Um, mm -hmm. we, we don't mind uh, the ethical standards and we, and we go beyond our conflict uh, um, mm -hmm. limits. So yes, it happens constantly. We're not giving examples uh, because I think that would be wrong in a, <laughs> in a small society. Uh, but we all are aware that this happens in public procurements, uh, 
in decision maker making uh, in other places, and uh, why not in in how lawyers and politicians run their lives. Yeah. Uh, there is the theory and there is the practice, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. there is a gulf uh, mm -hmm. between the two of them. What I'd like to do, though, is to point to judges. Judges are constantly having to make the balance. We, judges here and magistrates. They live in the same society as us, they have the same friends, they have the same acquaintances, and they occasionally have to make a decision as to whether mm -hmm. to hear a particular dispute with people that they know and they don't. And they manage it reasonably well. Not, it's, it's not a foolproof system, but if they can do it, I think everybody else can do it. Okay, okay. we'll come to the solution soon. So um, before we break, uh, Mr. Knights, what, what would you say your observation? Well, I'm not from Seychelles, right? Uh, Seychelles is the which is good in, as an outsider. Yes, yeah, this, this is where I'm about Fresh to go. Yes, uh, Seychelles is the eighth country that I've lived in for more than uh, eighteen months. Right, uh, it is also ranked twenty seventh uh, in terms of the least corrupt uh, country in terms of corruption uh, perception. Mm -hmm. Right, so the, we shouldn't be looking to really paint uh, <laughs> such a such a such a dull picture because it's a, it's a great country. And uh, it's just that there are a few things that you may need to uh, change in, and uh, in improve on. Now, when you compare Seychelles with other uh, small states, uh, small island developing states, it is probably ranked number one in terms of, uh, in terms of the perception of uh, least corruption. And if you also compare it with other uh, countries, uh, small countries outside of, uh, let's say, in Europe, like Malta or Cyprus, it is ranked ahead of those as well. Now, within the uh, public sector, based on my uh, observations, uh, there are efforts to ensure that conflicts of interest are reduced, or, uh, or people as well, they police certain things. Uh, I, I had a personal experience as well. Uh, there was an issue uh, that was was potentially going mm -hmm. to be a, a conflict of interest. And the chief principal secretary from the Department of Public Administration wrote the Attorney General and said, I don't believe that Mr. Knights mm -hmm. can do this because uh, there's a potential conflict of interest. And what the Attorney General did is that he came in and then assessed the situation and then removed me completely mm -hmm. uh, from, 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 from that uh, from a conflict of interest actually occurring. So I, I think that efforts are being made and uh, the public officers are, are vigilant and they, they try to do their best. And when you come, as, as I said, I've lived in other jurisdictions <laughs> and I don't feel as if Seychelles is a corrupt society. Okay. Uh, and uh, you, you, when you're in a different country, sometimes you, you feel as if, you know, okay, this is a definitely a corrupt society and I can do something uh, here and get away with it. But in Seychelles, it's a different feel to it. Uh, if it was that corrupt as well, uh, the human development index in Seychelles would not be so high. All right. Thank you. And with that, we shall take a short break and join us for continuation of this conversation. Thank you. Our topic for today is conflicts of interest. Welcome back. Um, and uh, something that has been said that's really interesting from Mr. Silva about being able to manage if ever a conflict happens, because I think we've all, Mr. George has said it, you've all said it, that it's bound to happen. We are human beings, 90,000 people on a beautiful island. We are bound to be conflicted. So, you know, what would be your advice? How do you think we need to, when it happens, and it will happen, that people are not scared, but that it is managed and it is transparent. Who would like to, to take this on? Yes, Ms. I, th I think this is the issue. I mean, it's transparency because you are actually, um, if you are in a situation where you feel conflicted and if you can be, and there is a, um, a scenario where uh, you don't have any other choice, but as long as everything that you're doing is legal within the law and you are you can you have a rationale for it and you can account for it 
and declare, then I don't see any issue with it. And if your decision making is unbiased as a result of it as well. So um, if you're being objective, I mean, uh, Mr. George talked about judges and lawyers and you know so many people and, uh, and I'm sure they have, they come across it every day where they are judging and have to be objective and unbiased. And if we can take that as an example in terms of uh, um, we, we, we be we objective, we're transparent, and uh, we working within the law. And then we practice it rather than just saying, oh, we have guidelines, we have procedures, and that should be okay when the Auditor General comes in to check your accounts and have you, have you spent public money. But it's saying to you, you've spent public money, did you give, did you do it in a fair manner? Did you do it in an open and transparent way? You know, did your family member benefit from it? And if they did, you know, how can you explain it? So it's a, not a, a culture where we just stopped, uh, stop working with um, members of the family because uh, it is a conflict of interest. But if you can explain it and it is legal, then, um, you know, because it is a small country, I believe we can still do it. I mean, it, it, it's not a police state, but as long as you stay within the law and uh, you're transparent, then uh, I don't see any issue with it. Good, good thank you. And Mr. Jeros, do you think that will bring down, uh, the, you know, the, the number of uh, uh, conflicts of interest cases that are hidden if we, if we are open and then if we do it in this way? Yes, I think so. I think like, uh, like, like everything else, we must not be too rigid. I remember some time ago uh, reading about the uh, president of the International Criminal Court uh, who, uh, during his tenure of office, whenever, however long that was, two, three years, uh, never attended a cocktail party, played golf on his own, never against uh, somebody else, and kept himself to himself. And I think that's an extreme example. <laughs> he did not want to be seen uh, to be yeah. ever uh, entering into a situation where the finger might have been pointed at him. And I think that's an extreme example. And I don't think uh, we need, uh, as, a, as, a, as a nation, that we need to be monks and, uh, and retire from the society in which we live. Uh, we are living in a society uh, we will be called upon constantly to manage conflicts, and so long as we manage them properly uh, and transparently, I don't think uh, there, is, there is any issue. And I think that if we, instead of trying to pretend that uh, we are more royalist than the king, uh, and we engage with the conflict, but do so in a transparent and open manner, uh, we will not only partially solve the problem, but we will ensure that others will be guided in the same way. All right, thank you. Mr. Knights, um, do you think that we have enough processes or codes of ethics or rules, regulations that would allow, you know, those practices that we're talking about? Uh, yes, as I said, uh, the only thing that may need to happen is uh, strengthening the existing uh, uh, framework. I, I know that the Attorney General is also working on uh, law revision as well as uh, trying to set up a law reform commission that can actually uh, look at laws under the microscope and, and, and compare different uh, jurisdictions with Seychelles so as to uh, improve the quality of the law as well as the procedure. And what we really, re really need to appreciate uh, with, in terms of having openness and fairness and uh, people respecting the rule of law is that we don't want to lose talent uh, within uh, a, sp a specific uh, division or department uh, because someone's parent is working at this ministry doesn't mean that uh, the son cannot work at this ministry. Uh, but there must be, as I said before, uh, with respect to the public service rules, uh, issues like laying out uh, merits, qualifications, and, and, and so forth, uh, clearly outlined so that uh, even if you're related, you can still work at the same uh, institution. Yes, yes, good, thank you. And Ms. Clarice, um, do you think, what advantages do you think that would bring um, uh, to, to NGOs, to, you know, uh, people who are doing different things, like you're doing, contributing enormously in our society, you know, once this culture, once this practice is being um, amplified? Um, I would say it would allow for people to contribute um, more positively and in different ways. 
Um, from a youth perspective, I would see, I would say, you tend to learn it upon joining an institution. And I don't think it should be that way because um, throughout a child's um, life, they observe many things that would bring about a negative behavior. For instance, they observe family members actually doing the printing, um, for instance, um, printing at work and then bringing something related to the school, for instance. They would observe um, other behaviors within society that by, by the time they reach employment, that would have uh, been inculcated within them. And that's the issue and that's something I'm actually worried about because the, the generation that's uh, coming and even the ger generation now are seeing these things and it is kind of normalized unless you're explained within the boundaries of the code of ethics at work. And uh, additional to that, um, I would say from um, managing a youth-led NGO, whereby the members are from 12 years old to 35, but at a very young age, they are, they are learning about how to audit the, state, the financial statements. They are learning about the different accountability to managing different projects and the funds. So with that, there is a certain level of education on the topic. So it is important that this uh, becomes a culture, even at the schools, because at the schools, there are different behaviors, even by teachers or the heads, that would give about the wrong message. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's something that should start early because the behavior and the culture um, would eventually affect the institutions that they join. Okay, thank you. So it's a huge advantage. Um, what we're doing now, we, we, we are talking about it. We, we, we are you know, making some noise about this topic and to show that there's nothing wrong to declare to say that that we have conflicts of interest and that uh, we be open, transparent, uh, governance, accountability with it, and then um, we're raising a, a generation uh, differently with this revolution that we, we're starting with the transparency initiatives in Seychelles. So, and with that, we'll take a short break and we'll see you soon. So we are back with our very interesting topic of conversation for today, which is conflicts of interest. I have another another question for the panel today. So in a small country like Seychelles, I think you've all mentioned, we all know each other, 90,000 people. Um, so what can we really, what, what um, can be avoided really? And uh, what do we need to have a different model for us, different from all of the different countries that Mr. Knight's was talking about, I'm not really one for comparing countries because I think the dynamics are very different. Mm -hmm. You know, let's take this to Cecil's context. Anybody, would you like to start, Mr. George? Well, uh, I don't really have, a, have an answer uh, other than the tried and tested stick and carrot. You know, you have <laughs> to um, have the institutional framework to catch people when they do it or to keep them within the bounds so that they don't do it. Uh, but you've also got to incentivize people not to do it. And I think uh, we, need, we, need a, we need a bit of both. Um, how do you incentivize somebody not to be, not to be corrupt or not to uh, do anything that will conflict ethically um, other than teaching people that this is right and this is wrong? And, and uh, in that sense, allowing them to make the value judgment themselves whenever they come up against, uh, against the issue. But we know that that is perfect in theory and impossible uh, in practice or, or very difficult to practice. So um, uh, that's why I think many countries, and we are certainly one of them, uh, rely on the institutional and the legal framework to ensure that when people, or to ensure that people are kept in check uh, and that they don't cross the boundaries and that when they do, that they are taken to task. And I think this is perhaps where up to now there hasn't been enough of the stick. And I think we all recognize that uh, uh, conflict situations bordering on corrupt practices do occur, and they occur right across the board from you know, 
right, right across the board, uh, but there hasn't been, I think, sufficient uh, attention, perhaps, um, uh, on the on the prevention and the punishment when uh, when one uh, one such case has has occurred. And I think if there is anything that's lacking, perhaps. That uh, and I'm not targeting you at all here, uh, uh, Ms. De Silva. Um, I think it's not it's not one institution. I think it's 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 the global framework of the country uh, that needs to that needs to change. And I think uh, uh, Mr. Knight comes in and he says this is uh, this is a, 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 a the perception of of, of 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 ethical standards is very high here, and I and I, I tend to agree. I, I, I tend to agree, but I think. We need to distinguish between the tip of the iceberg and the bit that's <laughs> hidden below below the waterline, uh, where the situation is is somewhat different. Uh, how do we address it? Well, I think I think the stick is perhaps uh, is perhaps uh, needed. All right, good. Thank you, Miss Rice. I'm coming to you. You know, being a young person mm -hmm. in this country, uh, you know, how much do you think we can accommodate, and and can we do like everybody else? Okay. Um. To add on with the stick example, mm -hmm. I would say on top of that is to publish the example, so make it known to deter any future um, such of such behavior. And um, I've come across. Um, personal conflict of interest myself, um, being employed and running an NGO. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've had different discussions on, for instance, whereby my um, employment place um, had grants. And as the NGO, mm -hmm. we did not apply for the grant, even though it would have helped the project. So we chose a different avenue, which would avoid the whole conflict. And uh, I've even uh, come across uh, this um, from changing division within the institu institution, whereby I joined um, other applicants into the whole process, did an exam just to switch uh, division. So I would say um, for me personally, um, I've encountered it a lot and uh, it's become a culture mm. and even uh, at uh, other institutions or other projects we administer, we find that we might have a project whereby we don't have to seek three quotations, for instance. But at the back of our mind, we're like, okay, we're going to seek three quotations because it's already a culture for us. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say it's in terms of a model, um, I wouldn't say we have to adapt to a new model, but strengthen the existing model and take different best practices from different countries or even institutions within Seychelles. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Knights, then we'll, we'll come to you because I know you have a lot to say about this. But um, um, I want to ask you as well, you know, because you said you coming from outside looking in, um, not looking at the indexes or just look at the reality on the ground. Um, do you think a small community, we are a small community, 90,000 people like Seychelles, you know, what's possible? What are some great areas? Well. You see, I came from, uh, well, I lived in other small island developing states uh, where uh, populations are, are, are small, and it's the same thing that happens. Mm. And, and what I'm saying, uh, based on my experience, right, uh, Seychelles seems to be more advanced than uh, some of these other countries, right? And so when... Uh, when, when the issue of uh, someone saying, oh, corruption is bad in, in, in Seychelles, I'm like, okay, you haven't seen corruption. <laughs> you haven't seen corruption yet. Uh, so, uh, but for me, uh, working at the Attorney General's uh, office and uh, also dealing with law revision and, and, and so forth, uh, I also realized that there are also a few gaps uh, in terms of strengthening certain things uh, within the uh, public uh, service and I, I also think that they should have like a public service uh, regulations in, in particular to really concretize uh, what can or cannot be done and uh, stronger institutions in terms of uh, judicial uh, review uh, legislation that clearly sets out uh, a, a number of uh, things so that people would have certain 
uh, avenues for redress. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And now we come to you, Mr. Silva, yeah. uh, with all that has been said, what, what would be a summary on, on this issue with contextualizing conflict of interest for small Seychelles? Well, I, I mean, if we look at the, some models, you know, like especially the Scandinavian countries, um, uh, they have uh, low numbers and they score well with regards to corruption perception. And um, I remember once um, I attended a conference and somebody said that, you know, in Norway, um, uh, very young in classes, you know, like the, uh, the children uh, are taught, if it's not yours, don't take it. And they repeat it to the teacher. It's like, it's like a mantra. They mm -hmm. come into class and they say, you know, like the teacher would say, if it's not yours, and they repeat, don't take it. So... Um, so education is important. So the prevention aspect, like Mr. George was saying, is, is, is as important as the stick and uh, prosecution. And then it's, it's trying to find um, uh, that happy medium in terms of a, a culture of giving. I mean, this is the Seychelles. I mean, I've grown up, uh, you know, with the family, friends coming to our, to our house. They always bring something, you know, and it is that culture of giving. When that culture of giving with intent of it being a favor, then that is an issue. And, uh, and I'm not saying that, uh, I mean, I, could, I, I do agree, like uh, we do have ethics in our, in our public sector, good uh, codes of conduct, but we also have very bad uh, code of conduct and people pushing the envelope, like Mr. George was saying, like it's it's saying, you know, like um, I can be ethical up to the point where it's against the law, then I become unethical, you know. So um, I, I I believe education is very important and a different way of approaching um, this whole issue of conflicts of interest and processes, procedures, and very encouraged to hear, you know, that you saying that you know, you, you as an NGO, you decided to withdraw and not apply. And how many people would have done that? All mm -hmm. you could have done was, you know, as the chair of this NGO, you know, I am not going to be involved. I'm declaring this. I'm not assisting you with your application. Go through that same process like everybody else, but declare that it's written that you, you know, you have an interest here because this is an NGO. So it's this declaration as well, which is important. You know, I mean, all public officers, see or above, you know, have to declare their interests mm. and their assets, you know, with the Public Ethics Commission. And uh, uh, it is the law and we do it every year. And now we have another declaration of assets commission for ministers, MNAs and uh, MLAs and uh, the president. So, um, but for me, it's more about uh, the practice and uh, procedures in place and then saying, okay, this is what we don't accept in this organization. You know, like at Anti-Corruption Commission, we've extended this declaration um, and conflicts of interest for all staff. When you join, you say to us, you are associated with this business, that business, you know, like when we have a supplier, we ask questions, you know, are anybody involved? Who's involved in this process of, of um, procuring goods? So we make sure that there is, it is transparent, it's clear and it's noted you know, uh, we go abroad and we come back with gifts. We then declare, we, we, we put it in this uh, glass uh, um, shelf, you know, so everybody sees it and we don't benefit uh, from it. There is no private gain. Mm -hmm. So this is where um, we, we ought to start educating and saying, well, this is public money and this is the issue. And I was delivering a program uh, once and I, and I raised this because this issue of you know, uh, we found out that there was this person, and maybe it ha does happen in other uh, public sector offices, they were photocopying um, church leaflets at work, using the work toner, okay. using the work paper, yeah. and thinking, well, it's for the church, it's charity, you know, but the institution is not a charitable organization, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, there is everything wrong with this, and, you know, as Anti-Corruption Commission, we wouldn't want to take a case like this because it would be controversial and they say, why don't you go for the bigger cases? But it's still educating people to say, well, there is something wrong with this. It is public money. You have to ensure that, you know, this is taxpayers' money and we need to spend it according to what we, we why we've got that money for, you know. So it's understanding this and, um, and not... 
and disrupting, and we, we, we talk of disruption because institutions like ours, we can't go after every single complaint, but we can say to an institution, look, look, there is no evidence, this is uh, low risk, but we want to highlight that this is an issue, please do something about it. So if you disrupt it that way and highlight the issue, then people start mm -hmm. thinking about it and yeah. stop doing it. I like that disrupt. Let's disrupt some more, <laughs> and I'm going to stretch this gray area. <laughs> um, here, let's turn this thing on its head 360 degrees. And because, again, I'm, I'm, I'm insisting, because we are a very small community, um, would you say there, there, would, there are exceptions, or do you think we should make exceptions and allow, or when is a conflict of interest issue, if I declare it, if it's out in the open, okay? Is there any time that this is okay? Who would like to, Mr. George? Well, well I, think, I think yes. Uh, there, there, there must be. You see, nothing is nothing is ever absolute. The the issue. Well, there are a couple of issues here. In fact, one of them is the moment that you set out guidelines, code of ethics or mm -hmm. code of conduct or whatever. Uh, like with laws, everybody assumes that that is it. So anything that's not included is permissible. Uh, and of course, it's not always it's not always the case. Um, so it's it's a question of transforming uh, that which is written or the parameters into a personal code of conduct. Yep. And I think that comes through education, and it comes through uh, educating about those who are punished for not doing it, but also educating about those like uh, Miss Clarice's NGO who took the initiative first and didn't fall into the conflict. I think the you know good stories must mm -hmm. also be told yes. uh, as well as as well as as well as bad stories. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I think it is universally accepted to, uh, to 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 answer your direct question that so long as you are aware of the conflict, so long as you declare it, and so long as you do not participate in such a way that mm -hmm. you will propagate the conflict, uh, then there are things which are permissible. Uh, but they are only permissible. Uh, when there is a full and frank and open disclosure. Okay. Otherwise, it must be okay. no. Okay, good, thank you. Mr. Knight, do you think we are opening a can of worms? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I take a different uh, position okay. to uh, Mr. George's. Look, if it is not uh, there in black and white, uh, it comes down to the personal value, uh, ethical value mm -hmm. of the individual in terms of making that decision. Who are you to say that uh, if I do this, it is wrong? Uh, how, how do we define uh, what is morally correct or ethically yeah. uh, correct? So that would be an individual choice uh, where there's the gray area. I'm coming to Miss Clarice because of her experience. I want to say, you know, how hard did it feel? Because people, we, we didn't, we talk about this, human beings. Let's not forget, human beings are about feelings and emotions, and that is a lot stronger than logic. So how did that feel you had to, you had to do that? Uh, let me just quickly give an example so that you can all chip in into this conversation of uh, if, if I'm a minister, for example, and then my family is in a particular business, that, that, that means if I was going to make a really good minister and I can't take it because of my family business, the conflict of interest, you know, and a small island state like that, you know, to me, if you ask me, is that fair? Do I have to, or the country, benefit from my uh, capacity, from my capabilities? Because it does not mean that somebody that, that is not in, in my shoes um, would actually not have a conflict of interest or, or intentions uh, not good. So in, the, in your case, for example, you did mention your NGO would have benefited, Seychelles would have benefited. You think sometimes conflicts of interest stop um, countries or individuals from benefiting? Um, I would say not really, mm. in the sense that, yes, there was this opportunity, but it was about doing the right thing. And uh, it was more about the perceived conflict of interest that uh, there would be to the institution if we did apply. And being a small NGO, and it's, it's evident that we are members, so it avoids the whole um, issue of even staff perceiving it as a conflict um, from management, from the public itself, and uh, regarding the funds. So it was better for us to avoid it 
and uh, seek another avenue for the project, which we did. And it's uh, actually being implemented now. So um, for us, um, this was better. Um, a lot better. All right, so there's some values. And, and Mr. Silva, do you, do you um, uh, come across any of, of, of these issues that we're discussing in your line of work, or do people tend to maybe sometimes um, challenge um, uh, this code of ethics or their practices? I, well, we, we do, because I mean, mm -hmm. corruption cases, like I've yeah. said, you look at where does it start? It starts okay. with the conflict of interest. And like I've, I've said openly that uh, we do have a high number of complaints from uh, procurement, you know, like anything where mm -hmm. there's a, a procurement matter. Now there's an appeals uh, system where people can appeal, but people find loopholes all the time. And that's what happens, you know, like it's the gray area, they will find that gray mm. area and they will find all sorts of loopholes and you can't legislate for everything. But, um, and you see where sort of the gaps are, the proce processes, the procedures. And if you then start practicing and putting in place, um, you know, a, an open and transparent system uh, where there's good governance, there's, um, you mm. know, uh, good ethics and people abide by the code of conduct. Everybody signs that in the public sector. And you wonder sometimes how many people are aware of what it means and what it is, what's in that code of conduct. And, uh, you know, I know one, uh, one uh, senior public official who uh, was going to join a ministry, but because their, um, their, their child was working in that ministry, um, uh, they asked that the, the child is transferred, you know, uh, to another ministry. So it's not seen that there will be that conflict and there's, uh, you know, uh, favoritism. So some people are very aware of it and some people will not. But if you have a rationale, what if it's the only organization, only company that provides this service, then it's open, it's transparent. This is the only you know, a company that provides, you know, security equipment. I can't go anywhere. Yeah. So I go with yeah. them. And the person who is linked to that company, you then declare it. They're not involved in that decision-making process. Then, you yeah. know, because you will come, you will have those instances, uh, or you know, and that you need to be able to be aware and then to be able to address it. Okay. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Good. So um, I think that we have exhausted um, the time that we had. Thank you. It was very interesting. But I will, I will end with giving you one minute each if you had your final say, your final word on the matter with this issue of conflicts of interest. What would it be? Let's start with Mr. Knights. Uh, respect the rule of law, professionalism, disclosure. Uh, Seychelles, you have... 90,000 people, and you have a country to run, uh, and there's a lot of developmental matters that needs to uh, take place, and we need to make use of the, the talent uh, that is here. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Kais. Um Conflict of interest should be part of your transparency and accountability framework. And with that, the whole process for declaration and uh, the likes, it would make it a lot easier to accept the decision, for instance, or the output of uh, different uh, projects. Um, I would like to give an example of, uh, um, for Mr. George. Um, it's publicly known that you're a politician, that you're a lawyer, that uh, you lecture, etc. but it doesn't, people do not challenge it. People do not really challenge your ability to manage the conflicts. So I think it's being open and transparent on the topic and your interest. Thank you Thank very you. much. Mr. Silva. Yes, and I think it's, uh, you know, uh, the panelists have echoed this, and it's about integrity at the end of the day. You know, like I, you know, we question, are we people of integrity? You know, and then to be able to, um, uh, to question any decisions that we make. Can I say, you know, every decision that I, I've made, I can stand over those decisions, in particular in the workplace, and say I've made this decision and it is transparent, it is open, and it is not conflicted, and I've not been conflicted in this situation. And if I have been, then have I been, have I declared it? So it's about this openness. It is about uh, integrity as well. 
Thank you very much. We started with Mr. George and we shall end <laughs> with a final statement from you. Thank you very much. I think, uh, I think the only thing that I can add, uh, and it, it, it carries on from uh, the point raised by Ms. Clarice, is peer leadership. I think um, there's a lot that can be said about emulating your, your, your peers. And if there is, right at the top and of any institution, uh, not necessarily only the government, but particularly the government, if there is a clear and clean uh, leadership, then everybody else will will follow, and I think that is that is key. You might you can have all of your laws, um, and you can have your inane knowledge between right and wrong, but I think the thing that will carry the day at the end of the day is to see that the societal leaders uh, are not ethically challenged and are leading good, transparent. And clean lives, and I think if, if if the moment that happens, and we see that in many um, societies, uh, the rest of the population generally follows suit. Uh, unfortunately, the opposite is also true. So um, uh, my my last word would be: let us let us do more of the good, uh, and our people will follow us. Thank you very much, Mr. George. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We conclude the topic for today, which was conflicts of interest. So let our leaders, leaders be the role models so that everybody else will follow and amplify the best behavior, the best practice. Thank you. See you next time.